here in this topic we are going to discuss about heart failure so in this module i am not going to discuss any pathology of the heart failure rather than we will discuss the pathophysiological events which takes place during heart failure so what exactly is a heart failure over here so heart failure is defined by any situation in which the heart does not pump its venous rhythm because of this there will be pooling of the blood in the venous compartment of the body there's a reason we will say venous pooling is a predominant feature what we will see in any type of heart failure as well as there will be elevated ventricular filling pressure because of heart cannot able to pump its venous return the volume of the blood which is present in the chamber of the heart that is left ventricle is maximum there's a reason there will be elevated ventricular filling pressure so here heart failure has been divided into two types one is called as systolic dysfunction and second one is called as diastolic dysfunction so what is systolic dysfunction remember systole means contraction diastole means relaxation during systole heart pumps the blood to the various tissues of the body from the aorta as well as from the pulmonary artery towards lungs so systolic heart failure is a problem of contraction problem of contraction and the diastolic dysfunction is a problem of relaxation problem of relaxation or in simple language we can say that systolic dysfunction is a pumping problem pumping problem and the diastolic dysfunction is the filling problem okay this is how you can classify systolic as well as diastolic dysfunction so what is the systolic dysfunction over here systolic dysfunction or a systolic failure is a failure to maintain output or a failure to maintain normal cardiac output because inability of the myocardium to contract enough so generally we know that n diastolic volume is approximately 130 ml if you take the reference of the left ventricle out of which 70 ml is ejected out that is called as the stroke volume right 70 ml is the stroke volume so to maintain normal stroke volume from the end diastolic volume the end diastolic volume is nothing but the venous return you need healthy myocardium if there is any pathology associated with the myocardial fibers or if there is any pathology which prevents the myocardium to contract properly then what happens is there will be decrease in the myocardial contractility there's a reason we are calling it as a pumping problem because of this from the end diastolic volume enough amount of the blood is not ejected into the aorta as well as to the pulmonary artery in such cases there will be decrease in the stroke volume so whenever there is a decrease in the stroke volume we can say that there will be decrease in the cardiac output there's a reason we are saying in the systolic heart failure it's a problem of the cardiac output because of an inability of the myocardial fibers to contract properly and this includes situation such as excessive after load and after systolic dysfunction the next one is called as the diastolic dysfunction of the heart so what is the diastolic dysfunction or the diastolic failure it is the failure related to abnormalities in diastolic relaxation we know that diastolic relaxation is a phase of ventricular filling if relaxation is not happening properly there will be a problem of the ventricular filling so if there is a problem of the ventricular filling remember that the end diastolic volume is decreased in the same way when end diastolic volume is decreased because of the problem of filling automatically the end systolic volume 
also decreases, ejection fraction decreases, stroke volume also decreases. So whenever there is a decrease in the stroke volume, because of the decrease in the venous return, the decrease in the venous return is mainly because of the decrease in the myocardial compliance to relax properly. So myocardial fibers are not relaxing properly so that ventricular filling is the one which is more commonly affected mainly because of decrease in the myocardial compliance and there is a frank sterling failure what we can say. So what happens in the diastolic failure? Especially there will be decrease in the end diastolic volume, right? Because there is a problem in the filling. Whenever there is a decrease in the end diastolic volume, there will be decrease in the stroke volume and there will be decrease in the cardiac output. In systolic dysfunction also, but end diastolic volume is normal, but because of myocardial fibers cannot able to contract properly, enough amount of the blood is not ejected out of the left ventricle. There is a reason here also there will be decrease in the stroke volume, decrease in the cardiac output. So in both the conditions, whether it may be a systolic failure or diastolic failure, remember that the cardiac output is the one which is predominantly affected. And most heart failure patients demonstrate systolic heart failure when compared to that of the diastolic heart failure. So there is a reason systolic heart failure is more commonly seen when compared to that of the diastolic heart failure. So here let us discuss in detail about left ventricular systolic failure. So whenever there is a problem in the contractility, whenever there is a problem in the myocardium to contract enough cardiac output, it is mainly because of decrease in the contractility, right? Decrease in the contractility and there will be decrease in the ejection fraction. This is what you will see in the systolic heart failure. I am talking about the systolic heart failure over here. Decrease in the contractility decrease in the ejection fraction, decrease in the stroke volume, right? decrease in the stroke volume. But remember, there will be increase in the end systolic volume over here, increase in the end systolic volume. Why there is an increase in the end systolic volume? Because as I already mentioned that end diastolic volume is 130 ml if you take approximate figure out of which in normal conditions 70 ml is the one which is ejected which is called as stroke volume and n systolic volume that is n systolic volume which is approximately 60 ml right this is the normal physiology but because of the problem in the contractility what happens is there will be a decrease in the stroke volume if the stroke volume instead of 70, let us assume that it is 50 or 60, automatically the end systolic volume would increase approximately 70 to 80 ml. I am talking an approximate figures over here. So that is the reason we can say that because of the problem in the contractility, there will be increase in the end systolic volume, especially in the systolic heart failure, what you need to remember and there would be increase in the preload. There would be increase in the preload. If you review once again in systolic heart failure, there will be decreased contractility, decrease in the ejection fraction, decrease in the stroke volume, but there would be increase in the end systolic volume and there would be increase in the preload. So here the increased preload is an inherent adaptation so here, the increased preload is an inherent adaptation to the partially compensate for the loss of contractility. That is the reason there will be increase in the preload. And in such cases of systolic heart failure, remember that the pressure volume loop shift towards right and there would be a venous pooling as well as pulmonary congestion. So why there would be a venous pooling as well as pulmonary congestion? Because if left ventricle is not contracting properly, there would be increase in the left ventricular end diastolic pressure and diastolic volume. So in the same way, there would be increase in the backward pressure in the circuit 
for example, like increase in the left atrial pressure, increase in the pulmonary venous pressure, and finally, there would be increase in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure that leads to pulmonary congestion and that leads to pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. And this pulmonary edema, which in turn causes uh, increase in the pulmonary artery hypertension that leads to right heart failure and this right heart failure can cause uh, pooling of the blood in the lower part of the body. So, this is how there would be a congestion initially in the lungs that is pulmonary edema can develop. In later stages, majority of the cases there would be pooling of the blood in the lower part of the body. This is what we will see in the systolic heart failure. After discussing the systolic heart failure, the next one is called as a diastolic heart failure. As you already mentioned that the diastolic heart failure is nothing but problem in the filling, filling problem. And generally in the filling phase, the pressure in the left ventricle is higher when compared to that of the normal, which is a predominant feature what we will see in the diastolic left ventricular failure. And in such cases, the pressure volume loop is shifted upward and there would be a venous congestion. The venous congestion is again because of the same, because of pooling of the blood in the left ventricle which in turn causes backward flow of the blood or backward pressure increases, pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema and finally leads to venous congestion in the lower part of the body in long standing cases. Generally whenever a patient develops this diastolic left ventricular failure, there would be neurohumeral compensation. There would be neurohumoral compensation. Remember that this neurohumoral compensation is a very short term compensatory mechanisms, but the long term mechanism actually the one which contributes towards the development of left ventricular diastolic failure. What generally happens in the neurohumoral compensatory mechanism? Generally, what happens is whenever there is a diastolic, diastolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, there would be decrease in the end diastolic volume. Whenever there is a decrease in the end diastolic volume, automatically there would be decrease in the ejection fraction, there would be decrease in the stroke volume. That leads to decrease in the systolic blood pressure, especially in the iota. This is what generally seen in the diastolic dysfunction. So, the compensatory mechanisms play a predominant role over here when this condition happens. That is, there would be increase in the sympathetic discharge. This is very important point. This is a short term neurohumoral compensatory mechanism. Once it initiates, there will be increase in the sympathetic discharge. There would be increase in the total peripheral resistance. Increase in the total peripheral resistance and there will be increase in venoconstriction. There would be venoconstriction and not only that, to increase the inotropic mechanism of the heart, there would be increase in beta 1 receptor upregulation, especially in the myocardial fibers in the myocardium. So, increase in the beta 1 receptors of the heart that is upregulation of the beta 1 receptors and not only that, because of the decrease in the end diastolic volume, decrease in the ejection fraction, decrease in the stroke volume, decrease in the cardiac output and there is a decreased renal perfusion which in turn leads to increased production of renin by the kidneys. So, there would be increase in renin also, right? Increase in the sympathetic discharge, increase in the total peripheral resistance, there would be increase in the venoconstriction and increase that is upregulation of the beta 1 receptors in the myocardium and there would be increase in the renin. Whenever there is an increase in the renin, we know that there would be increase in aldosterone and this aldosterone is responsible for sodium as well as water retention. Whenever there is a sodium as well as water retention, there would be increase in the blood volume, increase in the venous return, there would be increase in the 
heart rate as well as increase in the cardiac output. So this is how compensatory mechanisms play an important role that is play an important role during diastolic dysfunction of the heart. But remember that the neurohumoral mechanisms are extremely short term and the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism is always long term, right? This is what is important. Now, whenever the renin angiotensin mechanism play an important role in the compensatory mechanism of the diastolic dysfunction of the heart, there would be increase in aldosterone production and there would be increase in the total peripheral resistance again by means of aldosterone and the aldosterone function is sodium and water retention. So, there would be increase in the blood volume, right? Increase in the blood volume. So, increase in the renin causes increase in the aldosterone production which in turn causes sodium as well as water retention finally leads to increase in the blood volume. Whenever there is an increase in the blood volume, remember that increase in the venous return, right? Increase in the blood volume leads to increase in the venous return towards the heart. Increase in the venous return is nothing but called as increase in the preload, right? So, there would be increase in the preload. All these are the compensatory mechanisms which play a predominant role to increase preload, especially during diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. Now, so during diastolic dysfunction of the heart, not only because of aldosterone as well as renin, there would be increase in the blood volume, there will be increase in the ADH also. So, increase in the antidiuretic hormone also causes increase in the blood volume, which in turn leads to increase in the preload, increase in the blood volume and this increase in the blood volume leads to increase in the preload. And not only that, there would be increase in endothelin, endothelin, increase in endothelin leads to increase in total peripheral resistance. So, there are like so many mechanisms which play an important role to increase total peripheral resistance, to increase blood volume. There is not a single mechanism like there is like there is a, a sympathetic mechanism, there is a renin angiotensin mechanism, ADH mechanism, endothelin mechanism. All these mechanisms play an important role as a compensatory mechanism towards bringing cardiac output to the normal whenever there is a diastolic dysfunction of the heart. Now, Whatever may be the mechanism, whenever there is an increase in the total peripheral resistance will increase afterload and the work of the heart by promoting decrease in cardiac output. This is what is very important point for you to remember. Because of continuous sympathetic discharge, whenever there is an increase in the continuous sympathetic activity, it causes down regulation of beta 1 receptors. Initially, the beta 1 receptors are upregulated, right? But later, because of the continuous activation of the sympathetic activity, there would be down regulation of the beta 1 receptors and upregulation of inhibitory G proteins that decreases inotropic response. So, initially, there would be increase in the inotropic response because of increase in the sympathetic discharge, but long standing cases of sympathetic discharge can cause decrease in the beta 1 receptor upregulation. So, that is nothing but called a down regulation of beta 1 receptors which in turn causes decrease in the contractility. So, in long term compensatory mechanisms are not good because these long term compensatory mechanisms are the one which prompts the heart towards failure. So, that is the reason. Remember that the neurohumoral compensatory mechanism short term it is good, everything is maintained well. But if these compensatory mechanisms work for longer periods of time, that will prompt the condition towards failure. That is what you will see in diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. So, by this we completed the systolic as well as diastolic dysfunction of the heart.